Business Growth Talks podcast is created and hosted by Mark Haywood. In this show, we talk about how to grow a business in the growth stage. The growth stage is often marked by rapid developments, increased revenue, and an escalating customer base. In each episode, we talk to entrepreneurs and business owners who have grown businesses, and we cover topics like scaling processes, market expansion, financial management, human resource and talent development, and customer retention. If you are looking for actionable advice, tips, and techniques on how to grow, run and build your business, this is the podcast for you. Today, we have Liz Presson, who is at the intersection of digital transformation, entrepreneurship, and healthcare innovation. Liz is a powerhouse founder and CEO of Pursuit, with a remarkable journey that spans from directing marketing at Digi International to revolutionizing digital communication in healthcare. Liz is a beacon of entrepreneurship and digital strategy excellence. Under her leadership, Pursuit has not only directed clinical research recruitment initiatives for Fortune 500 pharmaceutical giants, but also spearheaded public awareness campaigns around health epidemics and crafted advocacy programs for a leading medical devices company. But that's not all. Liz is a thought leader in the company culture, technology and team dynamics and has been a as has been reported on at Fast Company, Forbes and Inc. If you're enjoying this content, please do consider subscribing. And you can also go to businessgrowthtalks.com for more information. Hello, Liz. How are you today? I'm wonderful. How are you? I'm doing really well. Thank you very much for joining me. Um, So your business of pursuit is in marketing, but you're just specifically looking at the healthcare uh, niche, you've got a niche um, area. So I think it's going to be really fascinating here. And we have digital marketers on a regular regular basis, but I find it fascinating that you've decided on one particular area you're going to hone down and develop those skills. So I'll definitely be asking you questions about that today. Yeah. As always, my first question of the show is what does a business mindset mean to you? So a business mindset to me is putting on the hat where you're able to predict the future. Uh, At least that's trying to predict the future. That's the way I look at it. I, every conversation I have with a potential client, a client or a potential team member or current team member, I really try to predict the future. Um, What questions are going to come up? What issues are going to come up? And the big questions like, Um, what is the return on investment of this project or what does my future look like with this company? So I think wearing that hat is what a business mindset looks like to me. That is probably one of the most unique answers (laughs) I've actually heard on this show because a lot of people sort of think about like adding value and all these things that are absolutely valuable, but you're actually saying that whoever you're dealing with within the business, you're trying, are you thinking of trends? Are you thinking of, where the future for your employees going why do you why do you hone into trying to forecast and predict the future for all aspects of your business life it's important to think about predicting the future because i think you build in trust when you can help someone answer questions that they don't know that they have yet but that they're going to have And so when I'm already thinking about a team member's future with pursuit, or I'm already thinking about the questions an executive is going to have to answer about the money they're spending with pursuit, then I'm building trust with that person. And I think that that's really the foundation of my business is trust, transparency. And I think that, you know, credibility is something that has gotten pursuit to the 12 year mark where we are today. It's why people come to us and why we get great referrals. And so that's why it's so important on both sides. And and as you're in a, a service industry like myself as well, being proactive, I, I've I've learned over the years that when dealing with clients if you're being reactive to their questions and not I suppose in the same way it's it's kind of doing what you're doing but doing it might have defined it something differently with clients I'm trying to preempt them so they don't feel like they're asking why is this happening or how has this happened and things like that I try and proactively work out where we are with each of our clients and then mm-hmm. if they need a phone call or a Zoom call, just to keep them updated on things. For me, that's that's I think in service industries, being proactive is 
is a real way of gaining that trust and that transparency, which uh, for me as a service based uh, operator has been super important. Is it is it the are we talking about the same things here? Liz? We're talking about the same things. Absolutely. And I think also it's just um, a lot of because we're in healthcare, sometimes some of the projects or the work that people come to us with, they have a, an altruistic uh, mission in mind. But I've, I've been doing this long enough to know that, you know, it, especially here in the United States, healthcare is a business. And those questions are going to be asked about return on investment. And my message is kind of showing people it's okay for there to be you know, value to the people that we're serving and for there to be a business upside. And so I always want to bring those things together sooner rather than later, because if not, what happens is that do good project will uh, eventually get axed, whereas a do good project that has a great ROI is going to stick around. And for me, I want clients and projects that stick around for years and years. That's what we always aim to do. And I know you work with pharmaceutical companies, but healthcare mm -hmm. in the US has expanded with Obamacare and that sort of support. Do you get involved in, in that as well? We're more on uh, the clinical research side of things. So the way in which we kind of intersect with that kind of work is, you know, clinical research is a great way for affordable or free healthcare here in the United States. Yeah. But otherwise, I'm very much kind of in the disease awareness or clinical trial recruitment space. Amazing. Excuse me. Amazing. Thank you. Um, tell me one thing about your upbringing, which reflects on who you are today. Oh, that's a great question. Well, I've always um, I've always been a bit of uh, I don't want to say a salesperson, but I've always had a bit of a persuasive personality and I've always been trying to sell something. For instance, I remember um, I lived in an apartment complex when I was little and I started a soccer team for the little kids who lived there. And I created permission slips for the kids to give their parents. And part of it was a $5 enrollment fee. And once I collected the $5 from the parents, which thinking back, I can't believe <laughs> that they actually signed the permission slip and gave the money to the kids. But I had the kids walk, uh, we had a dollar store close by walked to the dollar store and they each bought a planner with their $5 and I made them write their practices and games and the planner. And I had a whole, you know, a whole soccer team, organized soccer team going, or I think my mom still carries around my business card that I created for being a babysitter when I turned, you know, 13 or 14 in her wallet. Um, so I've always kind of had that that mission to be organized. Organizing is really what it is. It's not so much sales. But like I love organizing and I love um, moving pieces around to, you know, achieve a bigger goal. And one of the questions I was going to ask you later, which I'm going to bring now in is, do you think, because you worked in at Digi International as a director of marketing, you've done other roles and then you set up Pursuit. Do you think you've always been entrepreneurial? Absolutely. Even when I was working for other companies, when I graduated from college, I, I had a job before Digi and then I moved into Digi. I always had my sights set on working for myself. Um, it's always been a goal, but I knew, you know, I don't, I didn't come from a background where I had a, like a big savings or any money really. I was, you know, in debt leaving college. So I knew I needed to have a more traditional job in order to become the entrepreneur that I wanted to be. And also, I know I knew that I needed that experience. Um, and Digi specifically was really helpful with that because I was a young director of marketing and um, I was put into a lot of situations where I just was challenged and I learned a lot. So I was very fortunate to have that experience pretty early on in my career. Yeah. And, uh, and what, what are some of those lessons that you learned at Digi that, that have helped you in your own endeavors? We'll be back after a quick break. You hear a lot about supply chains these days, because if the past couple years have taught us anything, it's that an efficient, well-managed supply chain is absolutely critical to keeping businesses successful and consumers happy. I'm Will Haywood, and I host a podcast called All Business, No Boundaries, where we talk about supply chains, how they work, what happens when they don't, and the innovations that are redefining what's possible in the world of logistics. Listen and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts.
Um, I think for the most part, I, you know, I went in as a young director of marketing, really trying to uh, change everything, right? I, I was hired because I had some innovative ideas. And so I went in thinking, okay, this all needs to change. And what I learned really quickly is that there was a reason something was working well before me and that it was going to continue working well, well beyond my time at Digi. And so in taking that to healthcare now or really to any industry, but especially healthcare, there are a lot of regulations and a lot of red tape. And I try to find creative ways to work within those regulations and red tape. But it, the time at Digi always reminds me that they're there for a reason. And, you know, just evolving and changing everything. It doesn't have to, those two things don't have to go together. <laughs> we can evolve yeah. and we can do things that are working. Yeah. Um, so I worked in corporate for 14 years and there was lots of systems mm -hmm. and processes and there was regulations yes. and AML and all this sort of stuff that we needed to do. But I think having that entrepreneurial flair, having that creativity, having that disruptive mentality, I don't mean in personality, but disrupting the industry mm -hmm. or disrupting your company. I think people can, it's one of the things that sort of encourage when I talk to younger people is that even if you go into a, a corporate experience, a corporate job, just try sometimes to think differently in that organization because you can bring things to the table which people wouldn't wouldn't necessarily think of or wouldn't necessarily and yes there's always there is always like thing like the, the word i a words i hate which is a british phrase if it's not broken don't fix it and i dislike that because i think things that have been done for 30 years obviously or, or 10 years are there for a reason because um it's worked but actually that's mm -hmm. no guarantee that in another 10 years that will still work because industries change regulations change laws change and therefore you have to be sometimes creative with it what, would you say in your role at dg like you said you there were things that that say the same but were you looking for more creativity and entrepreneurial flair to be able to do that role and, and what successes did you have by doing that yeah, I, w I was looking for more creativity and I was looking for ways to really evolve the organization. But one thing that kind of put me in the right mindset is that we did an internal brand audit. And so, you know, international publicly traded company, but it put together a really thoughtful um, survey for people to fill out. And then people could opt to do in-person interviews where I could ask them deeper questions about the brand and um, about the way Digi was perceived by the public. And I made sure that this wasn't something that was given to executives. Like I knew their opinions. I spent a lot of time right. with them doing the marketing and public relations for the company. I wanted the people who were on the sales team, you know, who were answering the phones when customers were calling. And so that really helped put me in the right mindset because I could find, um, you know, those pockets, like, people call and say they love this about us. So it really helped me figure out like, where should we be innovating and where should we be highlighting the things that have stayed the same for 40 years? And that's why Digi's known and loved. And so I think it's always great if you can kind of, as an entrepreneur, any situation, I wanna go in and find the points of disruption. And I think that that's a positive way to find points of disruption versus just, you know, innovating for the sake of innovating. But big pharma, working with big pharmaceutical companies, mm -hmm. they've been around a long time. They've probably mm -hmm. got a lot of systems and processes. So I'd imagine healthcare uh, with big pharma is probably quite difficult to be innovative or disruptive in there. Is that right? Or am I missing something? No, it, that's absolutely right. It is a difficult area to be disruptive in. But I will say it's one of the most rewarding because you know, I, and I'm very transparent with my clients about this, pharmaceutical companies have not gained the trust of the people that they serve. They have not been good communicators. And my job is to build transparency and to create communication channels. And so when they're thinking of using things like, you know, social media um, years ago or AI tools now, 
I really want them to understand that these are not more broadcast tools. These are communication tools and they're going to need to be used for two-way communication if you want to make an impact. And sometimes the smallest changes for the types of organizations I work with make the largest impact because there hasn't been much change in some of these stagnant older organizations in a really long time. Yeah. So in, in my corporate, I always described trying to change course of a corporate and I'm assuming mm -hmm. big pharma fits in this is like moving like the Titanic or moving a ship, like a large cruise liner, because it takes a long time. You have to get the right approvals from the right people and get the mm -hmm. and then move up a level and up and up. And, um, and it's a slow burn when you're trying to make innovation, when you're trying to make change. Um, if someone's entering a, an industry, one of some of my listeners are, are entering, it could be healthcare, it might be another large corporate. What advice would you give them if they were in the junior levels, not not starting or graduate or anything like that, but mm -hmm. they're, they're a junior level and they're trying to make a difference for themselves as well as the industry. What what things have you learned that people can initially like think what tools and techniques you've you've learned over the years that would be good for a new starter? Yeah, well, I always think it's great if you can bite off a, a small piece of something to prove value, you know, whether it's building your personal brand or doing something for the organization you're working with. I'm thinking about um, I have a lot of these types of examples, but I'm kind of thinking about Digi again, since we were on the topic. Yeah. You know, a big, a big thing of mine was that they're a B2B company, business to business company, but I really wanted to start talking to some of the people who were utilizing some of their hardware products to connect physical objects to the internet, the makers, but really, you know, um, hobbyists or engineers who are making things at home. And the company rightfully so was like, I don't think that that is a great endeavor at the moment since that's not our main clientele. So what I decided to do with my own time was just to interview a couple of these makers or hobbyists. And one of them that I found was a young man named Easton who had created a brain powered prosthetic arm and okay. it was utilizing a Digi product called an SB. And he had found out how much um, prosthetic us and had met a little girl who had one and decided that he wanted to, you know, try to make it better by connecting it to the internet and seeing what he could do to improve some, you know, something that a lot of people use that can often be an archaic type of technology. Yeah. And so I interviewed him and I decided to write an article about what he had done and I pitched it to Fast Company. And Fast Company picked up that article and it got mainstream media coverage for one of the company's Amazing. major products right. and again you know I did do this on my own time but it wasn't I was personally interested in what the 16 year old mm. kid had done yep. and I also really love writing and then the coverage in Fast Company really highlighted to the executives that tapping into these hobbyist I use hobbyist in air quotes because I think it's so much more than that these hobbyist yeah. projects yeah. could really create wonderful PR for the company and so I think if you can bite off a little piece like that to show value and take it upon yourself to do it you're putting yourself in a great position both personally and within your industry I would 100% agree with that what was your catalyst to actually start in pursuit you said you wanted to gain the experience first but what was the catalyst for starting well, I was initially going down the path where I was thinking I was going to create a software and get venture capital and that I was going to take that route for a long time. I first, uh, well, for a while, I was going down a path of creating a network of freelancers similar to what you see like Upwork doing today. Yeah. yeah. Um, but it really kind of shifted gears when uh, I spoke at a conference and I um, met the vice president of marketing for a company called Oticon Medical. And it's a medical device company that creates bone anchored hearing devices for people with single sided deafness or conductive hearing loss. Okay. And I started working with them as a freelancer, building patient communities online. So finding people who were using this hearing device, finding parents 
who had the hearing device for their children and connecting them so they could have peer-to-peer -peer conversations, collecting their stories for marketing. And I thought, you know, I don't have to wait to get investment from someone else to be the entrepreneur that I want to be today. And for a long time, I had FOMO. I was like, running an agency was working. It was going really well. We were growing, but I still had that pull towards it, it was the time too, where it was Y Combinator, Techstars, those yeah. types of things. They're still popular, but I wanted that world. And really, uh, as I've gotten older, I've realized uh, how great the service-based industry can be because I've been able to, to bootstrap this business. I've been able to um, find people that I really love working with and give them an opportunity to have uh, remote work, flexible work schedule and to pay people really well while not relying on kind of higher powers that be with investment and that kind of thing. Yeah. One of the things I hate about that area of entrepreneurship is they'll, they like, they might get investment and they, they might do that. It, it, it's a life change. Well, not like it's a business changing experience to get investment. But what I dislike about them is they've never been profitable and they're all high-fiving each other because they've got this million dollar investment. No, no, no. That's where the work actually really starts at that point, because now yeah. you you have to grow it and scale it and do it quickly. You've got a million dollars to do it in or whatever the, whatever the value is. And it always frustrates me that everyone's celebrating. And yes, investment is is a huge thing for the right industry. It has to be the right industry to, to, to be successful. But actually, what you've done and what I'm doing with the booking agency is that you're growing it and making it profitable and then you're growing again and then you move to that step. I, I had a I had a friend of mine on the show, John Briggs, and he said it is a constant evolving state of entrepreneurship or business owners because if you've never made $500,000 a year, you don't know what it's like running a business of 500,000. Or if you make a million, mm -hmm. you don't know what it's like running a business. Of, and if it's 10 million, you don't know what it's like. And it's and and that's why I always like the service-based industries because A, you're dealing with people in most cases, mm -hmm. which, is, which is a positive for me. But equally, it's those segments, it's that moving up that step, learning, evolving, developing the company. That's what excites me about business, not necessarily getting a million pounds and you're wondering where do I spend this to make it make it interesting for people. What's your thoughts? Right. Yeah, I feel the same way. I love putting together different models for running this business. I love I love the longevity of it. I can really look at the business and I can see how it's grown over time and I can being in charge of making, you know, I'm a solo founder. So I really intentionally made all the decisions along the way, which means I very intentionally learn from all the decisions that have been made yeah. along the way. So I really like being able to pull the levers without having to ask other people. Um, is this okay that I do this? Uh, thinking about the next round of investment, things of that nature. And also, you know, I think, again, for me, a big part of this is making sure that for me, I love I love the the freedom of being the decision maker, but it also puts me in a position where I really get to decide who's a stakeholder in pursuit. So when it comes to team members and paying them, I don't have to look at a certain chart with market value that's coming from an investment firm or venture venture capital yeah. firm. I can decide yeah. that. Um, and, you know, the the relationships of a service-based business, like you mentioned, are so important. Over 90% of our clients have been with us for over five years. And yeah. I absolutely love that. I think it's fantastic. Being a founder, a solo founder, over a number of years, how many years has it been in pursuit now? Um, 11. 11 years. Is it lonely being a solo founder? It can be. I think that there are a lot of great um, resources I've tapped into, like even the the Freelancing Females Network. Um, I speak at a lot of conferences where I get to connect with my peers. 
And honestly, I've become close with a lot of people uh, that I've met through working with different clients and things. So, and other business owners as well. So yeah, it, it can be, but it's not something that, um, it's it's not a big void that I've felt on this journey. Okay, awesome. Um, specifically into pursuit, what are the biggest challenges that you faced while directing clinical research recruitment initiatives and public awarenesses? I think the biggest issue is the one that I touched on previously, and that's the regulations and the red tape of the healthcare industry. Um, and also the biases, right? Again, Pharma is not uh, necessarily an industry that has the best reputation. Clinical research doesn't have the best reputation. And so I think I have a multi-layer job where when I'm going into these projects to work with some of these organizations, my first job is to suss out the eth ethics myself <laughs> and make sure that I'm on board with what's going on here before I'm putting marketing practices in place to tout it to others. And so that's a challenge is, is really being able to look at something and decide ethically, is this something that I want to be promoting? And then how do we overcome the biases that unfortunately, um, you know, have been co-signed over years and years of people having bad experiences with healthcare. And I'm not, I'm not asking you to name a name, a name <laughs> but, how often in these 10 plus years has your ethics meant that you wouldn't work with a company? Um, it, it's maybe, it's happened more often than it would probably like. would in other <laughs> industries. I, I would say, I would say we turned down about 15% of the work that we could win over, over time, you know, over the, let's say a decade yeah. or so, we've turned down about 15% of the work. Um, a lot of times I want to make sure that efforts, uh, especially when it comes to clinical research are focused, focused on diversity and inclusion. So first and foremost, clinical research has typically always been focused on the male white body. And so for me, if, research initiatives are still taking that pathway, uh, especially if the disease is something that impacts, you know, if, if that's not the main group impacted by the disease, which most of the time it is not, that's something that I walk away from. Um, and that's, you know, that's kind of the most likely scenario that I've seen come up or, you know, um, just situations where we kind of at a, a broader level, where organizations want to broadcast a message, but don't want there to be functionality for people to engage. For instance, if you do an influencer campaign sharing information about a disease, but you don't want people to be able to comment on it. Not so interested in that because that's not a two-way conversation. That's a broadcasting tool. Yeah. And and what did COVID do to your business with with Moderna and all the other companies trying to get a COVID vaccine. What was your involvement in that, in that whole experience? Well, all of our big pharma clients um, really shifted their focus to COVID interventions. So we really had to kind of take a, put what we were doing on the back burner, which was completely understandable and really just helped remind our clients of the things that we had taught them previously. The more transparent you are about clinical research and its benefits and risks, the faster you're going to enroll a clinical trial. Um, tap into all the channels that we've helped you create, the digital channels to share where clinical trials are taking place, use digital advertising to enroll. So that was, that was something that um, it was a time where we really needed to remind clients what we had taught them. And now we're able to look back and say there are vaccines for COVID because all of these pharma companies put their egos, uh, well, mostly yeah. put their egos aside and yeah. said, we need a vaccine for COVID. Here's what we need to do. Here are the risks. Here are the benefits. Would you like to participate? And here's the easiest way to say yes to participation. Wow. And I think that's something that, um, now we've seen it happen, you know, it shouldn't be taking 10 or 15 years to develop mm -hmm. new medications 
um, when we saw what can be possible with the COVID vaccine. That's so fascinating. That's a really fascinating area for me because, as you say, like the, there was a the accelerator was on to get a vaccine, and 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 I understand a lot of clinical studies and this research has been done over a long period of time because just to cover all the all the aspects that it needs to cover but you make a really valuable point that that uh, it sounds like there's been that shift from okay so this is a 10 year project where actually now it might be a two year project is there risks is there now more risks in the industry because now people saw what could be done in covid with covid co very quickly that there's there's actually now a bigger risk for the healthcare industry well, a lot of what was slowing down the development of medicine wasn't the actual testing of the medication itself. It was the enrollment of clinical trials. So okay. you can't perform a clinical trial if you don't have people willing to participate. And so I'm never an advocate about decreasing the amount of time that that medication is tested or the rigor that it's tested under. But that time to recruit is what we're always looking to decrease. The time and the amount of money it takes and I think that, um, again, you know, letting people understand how clinical research has changed, because I know that before working in this space, I would never consider a clinical trial as a participant because I immediately thought guinea pig, you know, that I don't want to be a guinea pig for a pharmaceutical company. And so I think that um, the transparency and communication there can really decrease that time to get people to participate and um, again, helping people understand the benefits of the type of really great healthcare you get most of the time when you're a participant. Mm, I would agree. Tell me about how digital media has leveraged mu the mutual value between relationships with healthcare organizations and their clients as well. Yeah, so I think Again, it, I, I don't want to sound like a broken record, but I think the transparency and the, the two-way communication is the most important thing. Um, I really try to look at digital media as a medium that organizations can use to help connect the people that they serve. And so I had mentioned earlier a medical device company that I worked with called Oticon Medical. When we created a social media presence, and um, you know, started creating content for that organization. The point wasn't to put their key messages out on the internet, uh, you know, on all the tools of the time. This was a while ago, like on Facebook and Twitter and such. It was more about connecting people with other people who were having similar experiences to help them find the best path forward for themselves. So. Um, I met a woman who had an acoustic neuroma while she was pregnant. And so as soon as she gave birth, she went and had the surgery for the little abutment that needs to go on her head for this medical device to sit on so she could hear and she wouldn't miss out on any of those early sounds of having her, you know, having her baby in her presence. And then other people with acoustic neuromas were able to find her story and say, hey, wow, this is amazing. I lost my hearing due to this specific type of brain tumor. And now you've helped me understand through your story that I have other options that I didn't know about before. And so I think that that's where the mutual value comes from is creating peer to peer channels versus using TikTok, Twitter, Facebook, whatever it might be as a broadcasting tool yourself. And in, in this digital age, as you say, social media is a very clear, obvious example. I'm just thinking on my social media feeds on any platform, and this might be my interest, but I don't see a great deal of healthcare organisations doing their work on content and storytelling about their content. Mm -hmm. How do you how do you work with a with a? Let's just use a big farmer for example. How would you use um, how would you work with a big pharma company when they're trying to get a message out, a story to, as you say, raise awareness for it could be clinical trials, it could be a medical device. Mm -hmm. What's what's your process of creating that content, creating that story for your clients? 
So in most cases, um, be, because I don't do much corporate communication, I think that the I think a company should have a presence for corporate communication. I typically am in more of a niche. So recruiting people for a clinical trial for a specific disease or doing awareness of a specific disease to let people know that there are new medications available. So typically where my process starts is we create a brand that is specific to that disease. So that way we can really pare down to that niche. So for instance, we work with a pharmaceutical company in New Jersey who's focused on vision health. And one of their big areas is myopia or nearsightedness. The words are interchangeable. And they have a product that is currently um, in the clinical trial phase right now for kids who have myopia. So what's happening around the world is that kids are getting nearsightedness at a far younger age and it's progressing quicker. And that's because kids are spending less time outside. They're spending more time on digital devices. Our environment has changed. And so we created a brand called My Myopia. There's a website, mymyopia.com, that you can go and look at. And there's a whole digital community out there that creates content specifically for parents about the risks of kids being high my having high myopia or having a great deal of nearsightedness early on. And that content includes tips, questions to ask at the eye doctor, information about how glasses, like what has changed in the world to make this an issue, how glasses change over time. And then we were just talking about COVID. One of the things that we did during COVID for this sub brand of this company is we had eye doctors speak to kids with myopia over Zoom and recorded those conversations and then put those conversations up on YouTube and all of the other different social channels. So kids could say things like, okay, well, I'm stuck at home. I'm doing school on my computer. What can I do to make sure my glasses don't get thicker when I already have nearsightedness? And the eye doctor was able to say, you know, it's really sunny out right now. Why don't you create a scavenger hunt with your friends? and spend a, you know an extra hour outside today or when you're reading your book at night make sure that it's elbow distance away from your eyes yeah. so it's really you know similar to what i've done with pursuit at the company level finding the right niche it's finding the right niche to make sure that you're not just throwing out to a wide audience you want to create the most specific audience segment possible and create something really special and really poignant for that audience amazing um how have you managed to build a strong company culture with remote workers at pursuit yeah that's a great question it's one i love because i from the moment that i start actually pursuit's original name was working remotely because i wanted to help companies i wanted a service-based business to help other companies create remote work systems. And that's still something that we do. It's just not the the bulk of our business, like some of the, the digital work we do. But um, we have pursuit priorities meetings twice a week. We use Slack to communicate. We use Asana for project management. And I think it's really just, we have really well-defined um, our synchronous and asynchronous communication. So what are the situations in which we are slacking about versus writing in Asana about like we've created it creates really nice boundaries but it also creates that really nice water cooler time that is non-interruptive um and then you know it's just finding the right people also I think that in our DNA, some of us are really meant to work outside of an office. We're meant to have office freedom. And for some of us, we love the structure of an office setting. I'm not the biggest fan of hybrid, but that's just because in my DNA, <laughs> it would still feel like going to an office a few times a week would be it's it's still going to the office. But I think finding those people who ha really have it, have the the love for working remotely and um you know just the ability to set themselves up in a in a way for success and know themselves in that way is a big part of building internal company culture in a virtual setting too 
And what I want to touch on is that whole water cooler conversation, cup mm -hmm. of coffee, discuss how you're progressing could be a very specific example. How do you do that for new employees? Because one of the things I've seen in other companies, larger companies that have um, worked hybrid or working remotely now is that <clears throat> the new joiners don't have that advantage of being in the same office and just walking past someone and just saying, I'm doing this, am I doing it right? Or questioning themselves or questioning what, what the process is. How do you create that naturally and sort of easily that people have those water cooler moments? Yeah, I think one of the, the ways, honestly, is that we have, as I mentioned, two pursuit priorities meetings a week, and they're on Mondays and Wednesdays. On Mondays, I'm typically like dictating here are our priorities for the week or you know not dictating but you know no, sharing know you here are our priorities yeah. for the week that sounds terrible yeah. um but then on wednesday it's more of an open floor where people can say here's what i'm working on here's how it's going here's what i need help on and so i think that that creates a situation for for others to jump in and say hey you know i did that last year why don't we meet after this and i can talk you through it Right. Or why don't you share your screen and we'll brainstorm on that together. So I think I think having that space carved out, for instance, you know, we had our hour this morning. Did we need an hour to catch up today? No, probably not. But we took it anyways because it's about creating the space, uh, even if you don't necessarily have the agenda items. Whereas I would never suggest that for a client meeting that's not you know not something you want to do in a client meeting but I think you really need to make the space um, in a virtual setting so what I do with my employees is I always say when we come in towards the end of the meeting is there anything else you want to add comment on yeah. discuss and that gives people the opportunity to do that and I'm sure you do it sounds like you're doing something similar um but you have to have the and we talked you talked a little bit earlier on about how getting the right people into your organization and if someone wants to work in a big agency in new york with the corner office that they're going in to see mm -hmm. that's not your company and and I, I totally get that and i think that's the great thing about this new environment post covid is that people who do want to more stay at home because of lifestyle choices kids or um mm -hmm. could be any number of reasons um it really is key getting that that right person, the right people for the right job. And I, I remember listening to this podcast and I can't remember who it was saying it. You need to get the right people in the right seats. And sometimes you get the right people, but they're in the wrong seats and it can be disruptive mm -hmm. or that people. Um, when you're looking to employ people, what's the what's the rigor? What's the process you do for getting the right people into your organization and stopping any sort of toxicity that could come from the maybe the right people but in the wrong place yeah well one of the things i found is that in typically um people who have worked in a remote environment previously uh are are, th are people who will thrive but more than anything i really suggest and we don't have many entry-level positions at pursuit we do have paid interns, um, but the expectations are so different. But I really think, and maybe this is a bias because I had, you know, in-person corporate jobs when I started my career, but I really suggest to people when they're starting their career that they go work somewhere in person. I think it's really important. I think some great experience comes from that. I needed to learn how to manage my schedule as a career focused individual with that type of role before I could work remotely. And right. I had someone tell me that at my first job, I asked a colleague, hey, do you think it would be appropriate to ask to work remotely some days of the week? And I remember he was you know, a mentor to me and he said, I wouldn't do that at this stage in your career. And that's what I suggest to others. So I think mm -hmm. it's a career stage thing um, on one hand. And the other is that I've really learned what can be taught and what are things that people just need to have ingrained in them. So, you know, motivation and um, 
the desire to build your own schedule and to communicate that schedule with others and to try to answer your questions before you slack to the group. Um, those are things I can't teach. Those are ingrained in you by the time that you get to pursue it or they're not. What I can teach are the nuances of healthcare. I can teach people about a medical re legal review process, those types of things. So I think that that's another important layer. And then thirdly, we do pilots with everyone who comes and works at Pursuit. So everyone has an opportunity to spend a month with us and get paid the same rate that they would be getting paid as I come on as a full-time member. But with the caveat that if this isn't working out, there's a mutual understanding that we just have a conversation and say, hey, it's not working for me. Um, and I think that that easy out at the beginning is really important. Yeah, yeah, I agree. How have you developed as a leader? We've talked about this a while, but I just wanted you to just focus up. How do you think you've developed as a leader over these 10 years plus of pursuit? I have definitely learned how to manage my own expectations and anxiety. I think that's the biggest thing. When I first started Pursuit, I could not, for the life of me, understand why everyone who worked for me didn't want to stay up all night and spend every single hour of every day. It's not their business, Liz. It's not their business. That's the thing. Exactly. 100%. But I just could not. You know, logically, I knew that, but I think I was always just expecting, I was expecting other people to be where I was. And that is a really unfair expectation. And um, I expected people to have the same motivations as me, right? I wanted to build a brand. I wanted to make connections. I wanted to be an entrepreneur. And it took me a long time to come around to, and you know, growth is an individual, not just a leader, to understand that there are other motivations. Money, and that's okay, but money is a motivation. Free time with family, those kinds of things. And so I think I've really just become a lot more in touch with people's motivations, meeting them where they're at, uh, especially learning more as my own have changed and just becoming softer. You know, I sometimes have to still remind myself, but not nearly as often as that we are not the healthcare workers. We're not the surgeons. We're not the people in the hospitals or clinics. We're doing an important job, but nothing, almost nothing is truly a fire. And it can almost always wait for us to take a step back and think about the, the next right step. And so... I've become a lot less reactive as well. Great. What's your passion? Entrepreneurship, marketing, or healthcare? Entrepreneurship. So if this, business, if, this, if this business failed tomorrow, and I'm not, I'm not saying it will, but of just course. say the, the business stopped tomorrow. You sold it. Let's just say you sold it. Mm -hmm. Would you start another business? Absolutely. And um, I, you know, I love, I love helping people. So of course, I mean, I think most businesses do set out to help people. Healthcare is a beautiful medium for that. But really my passion is entrepreneurship and creating, you know, creating businesses that are supportive to, to better experiences for people in all ways. I suppose, I suppose this is a bit of an unfair question. If that, if that day did come tomorrow, what would your next business pursuit be? Have you thought about that? Oh, yeah. Gosh, it changes every day. <laughs> <laughs> um, What's one of those ideas well, that you've thought, well, if I did sell, I could maybe try this? What, 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 what would you think that might be? Yeah, I mean, a lot of them exist, but I think they're in, in different ways. But um, a community for women uh, in business, a supportive community for women in business and um, coming together for efforts to just try to help the way people see women in business and how we approach things like maternity leave and um, the glass ceiling and things of that nature. So 
that's probably the thing that's always top of mind for me. Um, a lot of the people that I've employed through Pursuit are women. I'm obviously a, a you know woman business owner. We're very much in that space. So it's something I think about quite a bit. And they are underrepresented and under supported. A hundred percent. A hundred percent. Um, yeah, what's the plan? What's the plan if like you're not selling? I've I've now changed the the plan. You've not sold. Yeah. Um, <laughs> What's the plan for Pursue and you for the next two to five years? Yeah, we're going to keep doing what we doing, we're doing, working with our clients and hopefully launching, you know, these really exciting innovation projects that we have been doing. We're also building um, out a, a space for pharmaceutical and biotech companies to post their clinical trials in an environment where there's a lot of great information about the benefits of clinical research. And then we have really obviously um, become experts at promoting clinical trials, but we're going to use this as a place where our promotions are bringing people in for education, and then they can learn about clinical research opportunities once they've been educated on the benefits of clinical research. So it's really another pathway for for clinical research to get the light that it deserves in an environment that isn't living in the pharma space. Yeah. And and friends of mine did clinical research when they were at university to earn a few extra pounds and things. But I think I, th I think that targeted public awareness of the people that would ben could potentially benefit from these ideas, these innovations. I think it's a great way of being able to to build a business because I don't think even now um, I'm in the UK, but I have a lot of US listeners. So if anyone is listening mm -hmm. to this, put it down in the comments what your experience of clinical trials are. But I think it's a really valuable thing to be doing to to sort of share that there are there is innovations that might not have been people have been aware of. And you, you mentioned about short um, eyesight and things like that, but there's lots of other things. Um, do you do you so you 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 feel this is the the plan of raising public awareness for the right clinical trials to to be to be using for? I think it's a great idea. Yeah, I think it's completely necessary, and I think that um, we have a duty to educate people better about clinical research. I mean, I still look at a lot of opportunities. I've signed up to learn about a lot of opportunities. And I, I just think that we're doing a really poor job of articulating the benefits and the purpose. And so I, I find a personal passion in, in doing that education and of holding the pharma companies who are doing these clinical trials to a higher standard with how much you're paying people to do them, what you're offering. You know, yeah. the benefits need to be greater. And so part of this would be encouraging them to up the benefits as well. Amazing. Look, we're coming to the end of the interview. Ask the same six questions to all of my guests. They're quick fire questions. They don't need a quick fire answer. First question is, what's the best decision that you've made? Deciding to start a service-based business and not waiting till I got that venture capital for a different type of business. Well done. What's the best piece of advice you've been given? Oh, the best piece of advice I've been given. Oh, I hated it at the time. But I had a boss once who told me that uh, if I could be a little less intense, I'd have a lot more fun. And man, did I hate him for saying that at the time. <laughs> And that's not advice you can hear and make the change right away. But looking back, I, I think oh, I get what he meant. Mm. I get what he meant. I caused myself a lot of stress. And uh, I, I did have fun. But sometimes, at, you know, my own mentality got in the way a bit of all the fun I could be having. Um, who's helped you most in your career? Mm. The first job I had, had out of college was at a small company called Bolt. And that company was creating a social media management system for the automotive industry. 
And I lived in Washington, D.C. at the time, and I found the job listing on Craigslist. And for till I got my first paycheck, I was like, is this a scam? I don't know what's going on. Um, but it was because it was an individual entrepreneur named Adam Bolt. And uh, I had never I hadn't been exposed to small companies yet. But Adam really, through his own actions, showed me what was possible. You know, he was uh, an entrepreneur who had a number of different businesses going and was really generous with his transparency around how things operated. And I think at the time I was really young and naive, but just having someone show you what's possible means the world when you're thinking of starting a business yourself in the future. Absolutely. Tell me about a regret that you have. Hmm. Well, I don't know if I regret it now, but this is a, a funny short story that I lived uh, when I first moved to New York City. I was on a I was a freelancer um, for an organization and my contract ended a bit prematurely. And a friend introduced me to someone who was starting a uh, who had started a company that was doing pretty well and they were looking for their third employee in New York. And um, that company was Uber. And I met this gentleman at a cafe called Saturday Surf. And he explained the position to me. And I remember looking him dead in the face and saying, I just don't understand. I can go out on the curb and raise my hand and get a taxi. And then he, fol I, he followed up with me over email and I, I said it again in email. So I literally have a paper trail of me saying, I just don't think this startup's going to work out, man. So probably that. That's amazing. What a great story. Um, yeah. Do you, do you regret it now? Like where would you Not have now. been 10, 10, 15 years right. now? You could have yeah. been a, an exec at Uber. Yes. A totally different lifestyle, right? I yeah, mean, yeah. it's one of those things where I wouldn't change where I'm at for, for sure. anything. But sure. it's it's one of those, like, I'd love to watch a movie of what that life Yeah, it's like, like a sliding right? doors moment, isn't it? It's like, instead yeah, of getting on. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Uh, fantastic. Um, what are you most proud of? Um, I'm most proud of the the life that pursuit helps provide people who work for the company. I really, that's what gets me up in the morning is knowing that people are coming to work at pursuit and they're not getting Sunday scaries. They're not dreading their work day. Um, they're not, you know, scrambling to fill out other applications while they're working. For, you know, I've had, we've all most of us have had bad jobs and I'm just really proud of pursuit being a positive workplace and always working to make it better and better amazing um why do you do what you do for the reason I just mentioned really to help give people a platform for living their best life and being rewarded for their creativity and the, their skill set Listen, what does legacy mean to you? Ah, oh, legacy. Leaving, leaving behind positive motivation for those who come next, I think is the most important thing and what legacy means to me. Amazing. And lastly, where can people find you if they want to find more about you or your business? Yeah, absolutely. So I'm personally Liz Presson on all of the social channels. Um, I love hearing from people. Pursuit is pursuitof.com. Um, we also, you know, if you go to our social channels, which are linked up on our website, we love hearing from people. We are typically always hiring and we are typically always, you know, having discussions with potential new clients as well. Amazing, Liz. Thank you so much for your time today. It's been absolutely fascinating. And I think what's interesting about you is, um, what you've done is and what a lot of like mentors of mine that have, have said to me is like doing the 10,000 hours to be successful. 
And what I love about your business is that you've directed it towards the, the niche of healthcare, and you've really delved deep into the domain to make yourself a critical aspect in a digital space. So it's been absolutely fascinating speaking to you. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much. This has been so fun. I really appreciate it. No worries. Thank you for listening to Business Growth Talks. This podcast is released every Monday, so don't miss an episode by subscribing to all podcast platforms, including Apple and Spotify. Have a great day.